gospel of the Lord. I invite you to be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from the triune God. Amen. Come and see is a favorite expression of this gospel writer. At least four times it appears. In 139, some potential disciples ask Jesus where he's staying, and Jesus answers, come and see. Also in 146, skeptical Nathaniel wonders if anything can good can come out of Nazareth. His brother Philip's offers he should come and see. We will get to a reading in 1134 on an upcoming Sunday morning where Jesus asks Mary and Martha where they have laid their brother Lazarus. And they say, come and see. And today, of course, the woman at the well tells her kinspeople, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. In the same way, John the epistle writer bears witness to Jesus, the word of life, whom he has seen for himself. He says, I heard him, I looked on him, I've touched and handled with my own hands. We can only learn so much by third party intelligence. John wants us to experience Jesus for ourselves. The woman wanted her Samaritan people to experience Jesus for themselves. Come and see is analogous to come and find out for yourself. And to that end, Jesus makes a point of always coming to us first. He came to the woman first, breaking social and religious restrictions to engage a female stranger in conversation. He came to the Samaritans for the first time, breaking his own rule to confine his mission to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It's how grace works. God through Christ makes the first move without even our consent. Thank you. He comes to experience us just as we are. He doesn't want to change us so much as he wants to know us. Afterward, we better get to know and experience him. Last Sunday, we read from the Old Testament about God's call to our spiritual ancestor, Abram. We had two different text studies last week on Wednesday and then on Saturday at Sunset Grill. They were lively discussions and people wondered about how different individuals at each of the studies had ever experienced God speaking to them. Like God spoke to Abram or like Jesus spoke to Nicodemus or here at, to the woman at the well. One person shared deeply and vulnerably how that after a time of desperate prayer, the voice of God whom they described as the gentlest voice I've ever heard, how the voice of God brought reassurance and peace during a time of terrible personal tragedy. One person who was faced with a job decision shared how God had said, and I paraphrase, you can choose this new career path or you can choose your family cohesion and stability, but you can't choose both. Several shared moments from childhood where God made God's self known to them for the very first time. For a number of years, I was locked into a certain spiritual mindset that demanded to know where and how the Holy Spirit was moving so that I could be sure to be in on the action. After one long season of spiritual silence, I prayed with frustration and exasperation. God, where is your presence? Where are you moving? Who are you speaking to? Clear as a bell. The inner voice responded, where am I not present? Where am I not moving? And to whom am I not speaking? I'm present and moving and speaking to everyone everywhere all the time. 
Now that is exactly what Paul says in the book of Romans. God is everywhere at all times speaking and revealing himself to humankind at least by means of God's visible creation and by his eternal power and divine nature, it says. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day by day pours forth speech and night to night declares knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there words where their voice is not heard. And yet their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. The point is, is that Jesus is always near, ever present, first to speak, engaging in conversation, sticking with us all the way through, just like he stuck with Nicodemus the entire life, uh, the, the entire night, answering questions that bothered him. He sat beside the woman at the well through the heat of the day and answered her questions also. It's not an exact science, this business of hearing the voice of God. So-called inspiration has been used as a cover for human ego, and the voice has been misrepresented in some wild ways. Sometimes sincere people mistakenly listen and say they've heard from God. When Lynn and I were young marrieds, she once announced, God told her she wasn't pregnant. I confirmed it. God told me the same thing. God didn't tell the little baby that was on this way. <laughs> In spite of inadequacies to properly hear, Jesus is still present. He's always speaking, guiding, guarding, answering, pressing concerns, always. He speaks through his word. He speaks in the inner recesses of our hearts. I know sometimes it feels like he's absent or he's only going to help in some distant future time. But Jesus says, look around you now. See how the fields are ripe with harvest now. I'm here now with you now, speaking to you now. You have the opportunity to hear now. If we look to the example of Jesus with Nicodemus, Jesus answers Nicodemus off subject. Nicodemus asks one thing and Jesus answers something else. But Jesus addresses exactly what Nicodemus needed to hear. If we look to the conversation with the woman at the well this morning, Jesus answers her questions on point, but he also speaks directly to the issues that are going on in her heart and in her life. In the same way, whatever Christ says, he's speaking exactly the things we need. One person at a text study shared they were worried sick to know if a then recently deceased family member were truly with Jesus in heaven. And the Lord reassured them with deep words from the heart, she's with me, she's with me. Sometimes that's all we need to hear from Jesus. I'm with you. I love you. I'm with you. I love you. I love you to the moon and back. Listen to this message spoken through the mouthpiece of Isaiah. Fear not. I'm with you. Be not dismayed. I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. We need to hear these kinds of words from God when we come to sit beside the well of living water here at church. We need words like, your sins are forgiven. Or like Psalm 95 that we sang today, come near to worship, come forth with faith, bow down to God who gives us breath. God is our shepherd. God alone, we are his people, all his own. We need the words of peace that we say to one another. Peace, peace, God's peace, God's peace. We need the words that we hear at Holy Meal. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We need to hear the words of blessing and sending. 
God, the giver of life, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, now bless you on your Lenten journey. Also, go in peace. Serve the Lord. They're not idle words. They're gospel words of empowerment and life and influence and good. Whenever I may say, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy, the Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Whenever I may say those words or others like them, I expect them to take hold, have their sway. I expect God uses them to mold you into a different person than the one who came in the door. I expect God's words to happen. Because then you'll be sent to serve and to say and to share with others whom you love. Come with me and see a man, the Messiah, who told me exactly the words I needed to hear. Amen.